Thanks very much for tuning into my talk. This is a recording of the Bright Spark Lecture that I had the pleasure of giving at the University of Cambridge last month at IS Cambridge. And it was given to a live audience and not recorded. And I thought I'd seize the moment while it's fresh in my mind to uh, give this recording to you and to the world on YouTube. Um, as the title implies, the purpose and the discussion here today is about how to get more students and more people interested in geotechnics. And really to drive that point home, the need for inspiring uh, people to be interested in this subject, I'll show this image of freshman engineering students at Northwestern University. We have a rule at Northwestern, uh, within our school at least, that we can't have classes of more than about 100 students. And we have five sections of this required class on statics and dynamics. So you have about 100 students here, 100 brains. And uh, I've colored those with yellow dots. 100 people mostly who have made up their mind about what uh, discipline of engineering they would like to go in. So uh, when you look at, uh, say, roughly 100 students who are sitting here, uh, it turns out sort of a reasonable natural number who are interested in civil and environmental engineering are these um, dots shown in green and red. Let's say that the red are environmental engineering students and the green are uh, civil engineering students. You know, this leads to a roughly about 30 students in total for our department, which is a, a, a medium sized private university is a sort of a comfortable number for us. We have three students who are naturally drawn to civil engineering. And if you know anything about civil engineering, uh, you know that when you ask these students, what are they interested in? Probably they're interested in something like structural engineering, designing buildings. And certainly that's how I got interested in civil engineering. So I can't blame them. So here we are out of all of these students, many of whom go to biomedical engineering, they go to computer science. We really struggle in civil engineering, you, you might say, in order to attract interest. And in geotechnical engineering, we have a real problem that naturally our number is about zero. So how can we convince students to be interested and how can we convert some of these green dots to uh, be interested in geotechnics? Uh, in order to fulfill this um, sort of obligation or try to do something about it, one thing that uh, I experimented with is to run this class, uh, which captures my interests in soil machine interaction, more broadly terra mechanics, and um, brings in both undergraduate students and graduate students alike. So we'll define terra mechanics as we did in the class um, in a minute, but this is about um, uh, soils and there's certainly touches on geotechnics as well. It's a, a class that was run uh, early in the morning, 8 a.m. I don't think I'll be doing that again because uh, the uh, undergraduates in particular aren't that interested in getting up uh, to drink coffee and talk about Terra mechanics. But this was open to juniors, seniors, uh, graduate students, at least that's how it was advertised. And um, we're here to talk about these sort of images that you see and the points that are raised in the slide. And to make this idea of Terra mechanics a, a bit sharper, We'll define it here as the branch of engineering dealing with the interaction between moving parts and terrain. So uh, if you're thinking about soils and rocks, the key distinction here compared to classical geotechnics or geotechnical engineering is that the, there have to be moving parts involved. There's a lot of processes that you can think about, and here's a number of them that we uh, came up with in the class, this list, excavation, filling places, penetration, uh, CPT testing, in situ testing, tunneling, boring, and uh, uh, burrowing. And this was a tunneling conference, in fact, that I presented this lecture at. So you'll see some echoes of that throughout this presentation and various other things. The idea of this course was to touch on terra mechanics, provide exposure to terra mechanics as an area um, that might stimulate interest generally in the underground. And uh, the aims are described right here. We talk about connections to geotechnical engineering and geomechanics, and also talk about engineering, mathematics, and physics in general. So it's meant to be sort of a gateway class, which uh, gets into a lot of subjects, but really focuses on underground, as you'll see more of in a minute. It isn't a, um, a conventional sort of give homeworks, give exams sort of class, more project-based. So we did uh, class discussions, many of which were graded, collaborative assignments, 
uh, laboratory testing in our soil machine interaction laboratory at Northwestern and brought in people who could uh, speak to this subject, industry participants and uh, other players, as you'll see. Now, one big thing that happened when uh, I was test driving this class is COVID. This is an image of the classroom that we actually taught in or I taught in and the students were in for this hybrid uh, class. This is an image from a previous quarter where we were all sent home and we were meant to give a final exam. I, I stood here in the class in case any of the students decided to come in person to access the Wi-Fi and have a secure place to take their online exam. Nobody did. I was here all by myself. But uh, lo and behold, I was back uh, when we were able to do it in hybrid format. And here are the students that uh, is a list generally of the students that were involved. Three PhD students, two master's students. These were all civil engineering students already committed to uh, geotechnical engineering and three undergraduate students, one who is interested in civil engineering already, but not geotechnics and two who are mechanical engineering students. Um, eight students in total in this gigantic classroom. Here's Andy looking so um, ready. I was very excited to come back in person, but as we probably all experienced, uh, some were a little bit more reluctant to do it, at least at first. Eventually, we got more into the classroom, but I think this was day one where most people were uh, opted to be online. So given COVID, given an early class, given that it was a trial run, it's a relatively small number of students, eight students, but the perfect uh, number in order to test drive a class like this. These guys uh, and girls were my guinea pigs. So number one, I'll talk about the selected reading that we did for this class. And I wanna launch right into the key selected reading, which is actually borrowed from something uh, that Einstein said. I'll let you read that quote on your own. What I wanna emphasize here is school children. All our knowledge is but the knowledge of school children. I was inspired by this. I have children of my own and the very, uh, oh, I should say first, um, I've been sort of thinking about how we do not do a very good job in civil engineering and certainly not in geotechnical engineering of popular, popularizing our work. That's unlike compared to physics and people talking about the cosmos uh, why can't we talk about the underground in a more compelling way? So I, I, here I, I bring in my son, Gilbert, and one of uh, the, uh, our favorite books in our house, What If by Randall Monroe, uh, Serious Scientific Answers to Absurd Hypothetical Questions. If you don't have this book already, I believe there's another one volume out our, um, now too, you must get it. And I don't have a book like that for geotechnics, but with my kids, I, I sort of did. Uh, under Earth is a wonderful compilation, illustrated compilation of what happens underground. And at this point, the, um, I have to stop and reflect on the fact that this is something that children are very interested in at an early age. You're naturally uh, interested in what's under your feet, digging holes in the earth. I know that when I was a kid, I had a fascination with digging towards the center of the earth. Could it be done? Where would you go if you if you got to the other side. So we managed to inspire awe in the cosmos and, and space. Uh, we managed to inspire the, the these authors wrote another book, uh, Underwater, which is equally fascinating. What's under these uh, massive oceans that cover our earth and we don't really actually know that much about. What is underground? So this book I actually brought into the class. Oh, and by the way, my daughter, who also uh, saw that my son was in here. I felt compelled to put her in here. I showed her the slide. She told me to tell you, her name is Rue, that Rue on her, uh, this sounds very morbid, but she's decided on her uh, tombstone. She wants Rue uh, written with uh, Rue standing for Rue under earth. I was told to tell you this explicitly by her and we'll come back to morbid matters a little bit later in the talk. So anyway, both my children have appeared by now and uh, I get to talk about you know, hopefully without infringing on copyrights, this amazing book, which as you can see from the table of contents here, talks all about bugs, burrowing animals, ants, uh, plants, underground utilities, deep roots, up here, subways, archeological finds. It goes on and on and on about uh, all of the cool stuff that's going on under earth. Here's a sample of tree roots, for example. What are the roots that grow the deepest? And because I was at a tunneling conference presenting this, I of course had to show the one with the tunnel boring machine down here talk, talking about how um, underground spaces are created for uh, moving humans around. 
So that was how we got into this. I showed the book. We got lots of inspiration from that. Um, then moving it to a technical level, we actually moved away completely from um, uh, geotechnics and uh, classical sort of engineering. We, we, we looked at uh, geology. And the reason for this was when I first started to get interested in soil machine interaction, I knew that I had to make a compelling case about why this is relevant. And I was interested myself in how much earth do human beings move? It turns out that Hook, a geologist, asked the same question at some point and set about to estimate how much earth human beings move. So here were two images, these terraces and this mine that inspired his work. Um, we read this, this together as a class. And if anybody out there teaches a class like this, I would encourage you to look at this as well. He identifies in this paper, 1994 paper, three types of earth moving processes, moving material back and forth, moving it away from a location only to replace it and moving it away without replacing it. In the class, we had sort of a discussion, very nice discussion about whether one and two aren't in fact the same thing. Uh, and there really should be just two categories. I didn't have a good answer to that. And you can think about that as well. But the reason for distinguishing between this um, if we want to be very explicit, is, is to note that there are earth moving processes where you don't actually change the face of the earth or move the earth away. Agriculture, it turns out, as a type one process here, a huge amount of earth moved, 1500 gigatons per year of earth moved uh, through agriculture, through cultivation. Now let's figure out how much we're actually changing the, uh, permanently the face of the earth. Uh, Hook decided to think about three main ways in which we shape the face of the earth permanently, excavation for houses, mineral production, road building. He was able to get uh, good estimates of this for how, how much earth we move in the United States. He faced this question, how can we use that to determine how much earth human beings move uh, around the globe and had this clever approach to scale by gross national product. So if that's what we do in the, year, in the US, we can just uh, add up scaling every uh, nation by gross national product to find that 30 gigatons of year globally are moved in 1994 um, by these three processes. He also asked the question, well, maybe not gross national product, why energy consumption was uh, another available number. If you scale by energy consumption, then a little bit more, 35 gigatons per year, but we're, we're getting close, or at least these two numbers are close enough to feel compelling. How much, what does that mean? That's a, that's a hard number to internalize. 5.6 billion people on earth in 1994, um, this estimate that we have, 32.5 gigatons per year, based on the previous estimates there, uh, we can divide through and come up with 5.78 metric tons of Earth. So roughly speaking, each person, 1994, was responsible for moving six tons of Earth. That's three cubic, cubic meters, if you assume uh, a density of two tons per cubic meter. That is a huge amount of soil. And basically the way to internalize, or rock, the way to internalize this is to think about this as something maybe you would have to move in your own backyard, three cubic meters of earth. Um, and you have to do that without even lifting a finger, just by virtue of living in your home, uh, using your phone, using your computer, things that your car that require these uh, minerals, gold, silver, so on, lithium, so on and so forth. You move three cubic meters of, of earth. I've shown this to various people and some think this is uh, actually very much an underestimate of how much human beings are responsible for moving, but nevertheless gets us started. It's a lot. And to complete the picture the way Hook envisioned it, he was really just interested in how much are we doing compared to ge natural geomorphic agents. So here's a table reproduced from his paper. Uh, humans are up here around uh, 30 gigatons per year and he has estimates from, from erosion uh, sediment transport from rivers, what glaciers are doing, and so on. And the conclusion here really is just that humans are a significant factor. We are um, one of, if not the most important factor that's driving how the, the face of the earth is being permanently changed, changed. All right, so moving closer to geotechnics, conventional geotechnics, again, deliberately decided to steer clear of sort of the standard um, way in, uh, ways in which one would get introduced to this material and went for this extremely compelling story of how something that happened uh, in preparation for D-Day when um, 
they were planning this event, uh, the invasion of, uh, of Normandy there, they um, were wondering, are they gonna be able to get the equipment up to execute this, uh, this mission? And are the, are the, uh, is the artillery, are the people gonna be able to get up over the beach? And it turns out that by cover of darkness in the middle of the night, two British chaps with uh, uh, samplers and a few other things like knives and, and a flask of brandy, which we had a great time in the class talking about why you would bring uh, a flask of brandy on such a uh, difficult covert uh, mission. But here they were, two British chaps. They, they, uh, there's a nice story about having to duck underneath a lighthouse, but they managed to recover samples from the beach, bring them back to England. And really, um, the, there was lots of then interrogation of what can we learn from this? And, and the reason why they went with samples in the end was to um, just make sure that there were, wasn't peat on the uh, and clay on the beach that they did they thought that they were going to have trouble getting over so they didn't do any more sophisticated testing and that's a, a really compelling piece is to imagine what nowadays you would do in such a covert operation what you would bring the beach to get a good characterization of trafficability of the beach so this was a, a required reading for the class and compelling reading for the class and um that was, that's just a cross section of the things that we did, the sort of soft entry to this subject before getting into more technical topics. Technical topics. What do you cover in a class where, um, in this case, it turned out I had sophomores who maybe just got through mechanics of materials. And um, so it can't be deeply technical at the level that you would expect uh, senior engineering students or, uh, or graduate students to know. So what do you cover? And one of the things that I chose to cover in this class was cavity expansion theory. Uh, Professor Yu put his stamp on this, and there's this wonderful reference that's available, cavity expansion methods in geomechanics. And if you're wondering why cavity expansion, well, it, this is a very simple, very elegant uh, solution and problem with accompanying analytical solutions that touches on a lot of problems. For example, going back to this book, why is it that uh, there's a limit to how, how deep burrowing animals will go? Why is there a limit to how deep roots can grow in soils? And this can be explained with the help of cavity expansion theory. If you don't know how this works, the idea is that you have a, an existing cavity of some radius A naught that you're going to expand to radius A under a uniform pressure with some far field uh, in situ stress, pressure acting there. And there's a limit to this. If you think about clay, if you think about um, a simple elastic, perfectly plastic material, where, which is governed by the Tresca yield criterion, you can derive the cavitation pressure or limit pressure at which this, this cavity grows uh, unlimitedly under, under the, the applied pressure. And you can get this very simple expression for clay, for Tresca material, um, undrained loading of clay. Uh, where, which is written here, I won't go through this in detail, but relatively simple in a class where you have both graduates and undergraduate students, that the graduate students have access to the complexity of deriving this relationship and will know the theory that goes into it and be interested in the theory that go, goes into it. The undergraduate students, we can just leave the discussion at defining what yield stress is, what cohesion is, what Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio are, a little reminder of that. And then we can talk about the me physical meaning of this expression and what it means. And, and just to give a quick uh, overview of that, for cohesive materials or undrained response of, of soils, um, we have, the, it's, it's a linear relationship. That's what we just saw with depth. You have increasing uh, confinement, increasing pressure as you go down, but it's a linear relationship. For um, one thing that comes up immediately is, is the notion of yield criterion and something very fundamental for soils that most soils exhibit some pressure dependence. As you increase the pressure, it actually gets harder to, to uh, yield them. So for frictional materials, this, this uh, relationship really takes off. As you go deeper into the soil, it becomes very hard very quickly to, to uh, push your way through the soil like an earthworm would do, like a tree root would do. Would do. Um, so this was one technical topic that we, that we covered with some degree of success, I would say, based on feedback at the end. The, um, 
I, I mentioned that uh, this is kind of a gateway class of so this idea of cavity expansion, elastic uh, behavior, plastic behavior leads very naturally to the idea of plasticity. And that's a subject after my own heart. I teach a class in this at Northwestern. I, uh, I grabbed this slide from what we covered in class that uh, explaining that you can run these kinds of experiments yourself and understand plasticity by just going to the beach. If you're walking along the beach, you can see the permanent imprint that you will leave. That's plastic deformation, permanent deformation. You can also run this experiment, putting more and more weight on your foot and feeling sort of the resistance or feel, well, feeling how much, seeing how much you settle into the soil. If you, uh, if it's a dense sand, you get a relationship that looks sort of like this. As you put more and more weight, you, you uh, start to sink very rapidly at some value of load. You have to play with this a bit in order to feel it. And one thing that we cover is the nature of this relationship being unstable. If you have a low load like this, you're gonna find that as you increase the load, no problem, it's just gonna settle in more, which is sort of what intuition tells you. But the problem here is if you try to apply this weight, you basically sink in catastrophically up until the, this relationship continues for, for sand, but you, you sink in catastrophically uh, until the material is sort of able to catch up. So this is classical bearing capacity theory uh, applied to dense sands. To, um, uh, and the hook here in this class is really, if people are interested in this, this is a de derivable uh, limit, the limit pressure in this case, they have to come, you have to come and take a class with me or somebody else on uh, plasticity. And uh, I grabbed this, the cover of the Plasticity and Geomechanics book by Davis and Salvadorai, which is not only a very nice book, but uh, published by um, uh, Cambridge Press, which felt appropriately given where this talk was delivered. Okay, so what is the other technical topic that you can cover when you have undergraduates and graduate students? And the one I picked that I uh, primarily because I noticed that graduate students don't have enough exposure to this and don't think about this enough necessarily when they start their own research, dimensional analysis. This is something that undergraduates, graduate students all have access to. It's the idea that units really have no meaning. They're human inventions. Um, if you, in the US here, we use pounds, which shouldn't be used at all, uh, should be abolished completely, but uh, pounds, kilograms, or pounds, mass, kilograms, slugs, whatever. Uh, pounds, pounds, force is a unit of force compared to Newtons. None of this, um, as much as we might argue about it, is, is relevant to the universe. Everything has to be uh, um, dimensionally consistent or hom homogeneous if you're writing equations down. So the idea here was, is how do you take the, the, your problem, normalize the variables into dimensionless quantities from the outset, and then simplify the, the relationship that you're looking at and uh, use uh, expressions then, whatever you come up with that, that make physical sense, automatically make physical sense. So here we have a, the case of a, of a blade that's pushing through soil, which has a unit weight and friction angle the force is being normalized by the unit weight of the soil, the depth of cut squared. And if you're interested in this kind of physical process from a, the viewpoint of terra mechanics, soil machine interaction, uh, what we have here is that the, the normalized force P is some function of normalized displacement of the wall as you're pushing and the friction angle. So it, it looks, looks very simple. And, it, and indeed, indeed, this relationship, um, May or, uh, can be quite simple. We'll talk about that in a minute. So dimensional analysis as a, as a way to think about physical problems, get the fundamental relationships and then, and then do something with it. And that's my segue into a little bit of plug on, on my own work with collaborators uh, at, in Australia, stuff that I did before coming to the United States, which was um, very rewarding. We considered this problem of a plate moving laterally in the soil in a particular so the plate moves, um, is displaced under some displacement U, which I showed in the previous slide. There's a force that, a growing force P, it gets harder and harder to push because you have this growing volume of soil that's in front of the blade. The depth of cut D, the height, we parameterize the height of this material with H here. There's some wall friction, it's a rough blade. So phi W, wall friction angle. And um, in this case, the solution proceeds. We, we assume that there's a single slip surface inclined at an unknown angle beta. And the trick to this problem is really 
that the the boundary here is unknown. It's an unknown boundary value problem. And without going into the details, you can look at the paper if you're interested in in uh, exploring this in depth. It turns out that the uh, the fact that it's a moving boundary value problem means that you have a uniqueness issue that you can make multiple different assumptions about where this boundary is and how it grows. And we make an argument in the paper that there's a sort of undiscovered complete solution. There's two naturally uh, um, solutions that would be natural to assume, but they actually kind of uh, lead to a contradiction, a fundamental contradiction. So interesting problem, moving boundary value problem, unknown boundary value problem, this is uh, the relationship between normalized force and displacement of the blade. It grows, but the point of just showing this here is, is uh, you need to be very careful, even for such a simple problem. There are simple solutions, but the actual, there's, there's a hidden complexity in all of this. And to uh, solve this, get this correct family of solution, solutions requires a bit of effort. So that's something that we didn't go into detail in the class, but could have, and is just a little plug here for this recording and for the, uh, this, this uh, lecture. All right, back to what really matters, the students and, and getting interested in this. Class projects, I mentioned this class was project-based. Uh, most of the grade, most of what they were doing was just picking projects of interest to them and exploring that in depth on their own. Um, the first step, which we covered in class, is to, to identify on your own potential research topics. We had a discussion about how to do that. Make sure you're following your own interests. Make sure you have a good question in mind. We talked about some of them here already, and, and here are a few more that I jotted down from this class. How much of humans shape the face of the earth? Why are ants so much faster at building underground than humans? How do razor clams burrow into soil? How do plants grow into soil? What's the physical process by which that works? How would one build a burrowing robot if you were going to try to do that? And that's something that uh, is of uh, considerable interest nowadays at uh, various places around the globe is actually is burrowing soft robotics. What is the most efficient mode of locomotion in sand? Is that answer, uh, is there even an answer to that question? Uh, locomotion, here's a picture from uh, a DARPA challenge where they had uh, walking robots and, and apparently it was quite comical. And you can see here one that is uh, tipping over and uh, it's, they struggle is the bottom line. On, on hard surfaces, robots do very well, mobile robots, but on soft surfaces, uneven terrain, the story is very different. How can the speed of underground construction be accelerated? I'll make a reference here. This was asked by Elon Musk, why don't we build underground more than we do? It's a legitimate question. I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, how do you get this happened while we were, we were in class? A 200,000 200, ton ships uh, free when it gets lodged in the Suez Canal. That was the ever given. What is the deepest hole dug by humans? That's answered in the book that uh, I mentioned earlier and so on and so forth. So uh, lots of questions were asked in this class and I'm sure you have lots of questions yourself. Uh, I come back to this, this issue of uh, building underground when Elon Musk was thinking about um, building high-speed rail here in, in Chicago. I was one of the people that was approached for a perspective. And actually, I have to hasten to say that I admire that somebody just wanted to do it, uh, build this thing underground, but uh, I could, couldn't really see uh, in what way you know, we, we have a big innovation on the horizon for how we could do this better, faster from the building underground standpoint. And it turns out you can go and listen to the whole um, interview with John Williams from WGN Radio uh, that you have to be careful with these things. I'm now out there as uh, labeled as a skeptic, which is fine, I suppose, in a classical sense. But um, yes, yeah, skeptical of, uh, of you know, some of the underestimated difficulty in building a tunnel from O'Hare Airport to downtown, but uh, a big fan of people who take the initiative and, and just try to do something and make the world a better place, if that is in fact what's motivating them. Topics that the students picked. So these are not my own topics. These are what the students decided to look at on their own. Mobility of Mars exploration rovers, burrowing adaptations for organisms, soil wheel interaction, stone carving, Additive manufacturing, 3D printing with concrete and clay. Effective geologic formations on TBM operation. Snow removal. And installation methods and load transfer mechanisms for pile foundations. 
here's it, the process by which the students pick these different topics um, was a very nonlinear one. And here's a slide from when we were on Zoom in this hybrid format, sort of looking at applications and people putting their marks next to what they thought was interesting. So we didn't get too much overlap, if any overlap, and we really did got none in the end. Um, and students actually decided to deviate a lot from what they uh, what they decided here. So here I'll just give you a little cross section of what some of the slides and the final that were actually given for the final presentations. Uh, ben here was very interested in what's going on with the uh, uh, Mars rovers, and there's a lot of ground to cover in that. He did a great job looking at this fascinating um, tale of of uh, mobility of these things. What ha how do you get a Martian rover unstuck? Andy looked into snow plowing, and I was very pleased to see that he was uh, looking at references and paying attention to those that were careful about how they uh, presented their, their formulae and, and findings in these dimensionless, using dimensionless variables. Here in the Midwest, obviously, snow plowing is a, is a big uh, area of interest, and, and certainly we can allow snow as a, as a uh, type of terrain, and snow is pretty interesting. Um, why, uh, what do we got here? Burrowing adaptations from Christopher Lee. He got interested in, um, in the idea of plants and animals burrowing and, and delve deep into uh, aspects of friction and adhesion, as you can see, and we had nice discussions on that. I mentioned that we'd come back to morbid things and the, this was the first slide that Christopher showed in his presentation, grave digging, human ad adaptations to, to burrowing using shovels. So we had a nice discussion on this as well. And my, my daughter, Rue would be very pleased to see this. Uh, hopefully she watches this one day. <laughs> the um, topic of stone carving I thought was just amazing um, to listen to this and see this. Uh, certainly something that's a, in, incredibly relevant, feels like today now more than ever when we're looking at sustainable uh, building practices. If you look at the pyramids, if you look at people who built effectively with castles, people who built effectively with stone in the, in the past, they knew how to shape this material. So, and that's a fascinating story of how do you cut, how do you fracture, how do you remove material from, from stone. Uh, Olivia was very interested in, is still very interested in additive manufacturing, and, and uh, she took an interesting take on, on this um, form of terra mechanics, again, definition being moving parts and soils, 3D printing with clays. And uh, I won't say more about this because that was the content of her presentation and I'm not sure that I could do it justice. Finally, I was gratified to show this at the tunneling conference. Um, Shubjat was, uh, was very interested in, um, in TBMs and the, the sort of terra mechanics aspects of it too. And I'm sorry, this is from a paper, but I don't give shout out to the authors who did this. Send me an email or whatever and I'll, uh, um, I'll find it for you. I can ask Shubjat or I think I have his original slides. All right, I'm winding down now, getting close to the end. Something else you can do to generate interest and make sure that people understand that there's plenty of demand for this kind of expertise is to invite industry experts and other speakers to come in. Something that happened, I'll just give this one example. Um, uh, something that happened while I was teaching this class was that I was also involved in co-organizing, uh, helping to organize this global sand crisis webinar, where we had a, the keynote speaker, Vince Beiser, who wrote World in a Grain, talking about how much sand we use as uh, human beings use, and it's really led to this crisis, black markets and sand in various places in the world. And we're, we're destroying riverbeds by, um, and other areas and causing huge ecological damage by uh, harvesting sand uh, as we do. So I, I won't belabor that. You can read the book, but just talk about, um, the, show this one example of one of the many speakers that, that talked in that. Uh, Gary Greenberg was a photographer who invented his own uh, camera for basically doing 3D images of sand. He showed sands that he's collected from all over the world and photographed in a very elegant way. And um, the students got to see, as part of this class, attend this for free and, uh, and see, um, see this and get the same level of interest in sand that, that Gary does, at least see that. The final thing that we didn't actually get to complete, we sort of ran out of time, COVID uh, complications, so on and so forth. I gave it to the students democratically. You know, they voted, they decided on their own. It was a close call. It was about half and half, but the, uh, the let's just call the class here won in the end. 
uh, we didn't go forward with this prediction contest, but the idea was uh, we did get the students down in the lab to see this stuff in action. Uh, it's just that the prediction piece that I'll talk about in a minute didn't uh, actually happen. Here in the at Northwestern, we have this fluidized bed, um, which you'll see a, a video of this in a moment, um, is able to reconstitute sand samples um, eff effectively, efficiently, repeatedly to run uh, sort of parametric analysis. We can do um, large quantities of testing with different trajectories, different tool shapes. Um, and um, let me play the video for you. want to see a, some fluidization? This is going to be a real-time experiment. Think, think building. That is a building there. This is like a, maybe a gas tank, right? Switch it on, Jaffe. This now has turned into a, a boat. Yeah. And our underground structure here turned into a, uh, it flipped over. So it didn't actually float to the surface, but if it was empty, it would. And uh, check that out. Our what? sand has gone from solid to liquid. Oh my God. So there you have it, um, a nice way of reconstituting sand samples very quickly. Again, a little plug with uh, Jifei Jin, who's graduated, but she uh, labored on this and other uh, projects um, while she was here and really took ownership of the lab in a wonderful way. She not only uh, built this, it was the lead on building this apparatus, but she also went in and used the penetrometer attached to the robot arm that you saw there uh, and ran penetration tests as she was reconstituting this, this bed in different ways to figure out how uniform is it and what kind of densities are we getting to confirm the kind of densities that we're getting. So again, there's a paper here that you can uh, check out if you're interested in the details of this, but basically uh, if you want to get a dense sample, you have to defluidize. It's very easy to get loose samples. You just uh, fluidize the sample and then switch the airflow off as quick as you can and you get a loose sample. Getting a dense sample, you have to defluidize over very long times and uh, so long that it's actually kind of prohibitive, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But here's a different defluidization times leading to uh, increased density. And you can see we go from loose to dense or looser to denser. If I move to the next slide here, um, Here's a plot showing what kind of relative density you get depending on the defluidization time. And there are three different curves plotted here. The first one, uh, defluidization only, is the one that I mentioned. You just you fluidize and then you, you slow down the rate at which you're turning off the, uh, the air supply, blowing air through. It turns out you have to wait a really long time and, and you still don't get a very dense sample. So one of the tricks that uh, Jaffe came up with is if you I either vibrate the sample while you're um, defluidizing, that would be defluidization concurrent with vibration, or deflu def uh, vibrate the sample after you've defluidized, you can accelerate that process. So this is in fact what we do. If you, there's a eccentric weight with, on a motor on the, the bed, and if you vibrate the sample while you're defluidizing, you can get a relatively dense sample, a very, a very dense sample uh, in a relatively small amount of time, a reasonable amount of time. Otherwise you have to wait, wait say on the order of many hours, you know, day for your sample to, to densify for a bed like this. Here is just one to show the uh, robot as an actuator. It's a standard six axis industrial robot. And this is just a little video made by Jaffe uh, very kindly when I asked her to, to uh, just have a little the robot go through some motions, you can see that it can do whatever you want, move laterally, move in, and, and twist around. So you have lots of uh, freedom with a robot that's like this. And it's a very stiff setup we demonstrated capable of um, doing this kind of testing. 
Now, as I mentioned, what we would have done with this had we uh, had more time is we would have not only gone into the lab and see this uh, and get excited about the potential of this operation that we have, but we actually would have done a prediction contest. And what we decided, um, we went through the motions of deciding what that should look like before deciding democratically that we'll just uh, leave this for, for a future class to experiment with or experiment on. Um, we would do uh, leave it to the students to choose one of the following tests. We'd run all three of these tests in the lab, but students would have to come up with their own predictions for what they think is going to happen for one of them. And one of the tests we already saw was a push the uh, lateral cutting test where the plate is pushed in and then pushed laterally. One is the penetration process for the wall, just what, what um, is the relationship as you push deeper in the what is the relationship between the displacement and the fro the force and then the third here is just all this is changing the configuration from the second one it's a cylinder rather than this wall shape so in geotechnics this would be like a sheet pile and this would be like a penetrometer but you can imagine other kind of analogs and applications that would be relevant so the simple kind of motions, lateral cutting, penetration of a wall, plane strain, uh, axisymmetric penetration of a cylinder. How do you predict these relationships? What happens here? And their task would have been to find their own theory for how this works and then, uh, and then apply it. So they'd have to go back to the literature again, study this on their own. Resistive force theory with um, uh, which I always think of Professor Dan Goldman uh, at Georgia Tech for uh, sort of decide, um, figuring out that this thing that's used in fluids works very effectively for sands as well. Uh, we didn't talk about this, I don't think explicitly in the class, uh, or maybe we did because we didn't go through with the, with the prediction um, contest after all, but that would be something that they would hopefully find and apply and try some of the students. Cavity expansion theory gets you pretty close, maybe for some of these processes um, closer than others. Plasticity theory for those who had my class, and if they were ambitious graduate students, then uh, of course they could use finite element te techniques, discrete element methods, whatever they have at their disposal. And then the idea, if if you would go through with this, would be maybe have break them up into cohorts depending on what level they're at, and then maybe have a prize or something. All right, so that's uh, enough about the course, and uh, a little bit here about I did get all manner of feedback on this. It was, it was overwhelmingly positive. I did get some thing, ideas for change. I don't mean to be uh, sort of self-serving here by focusing on the positive stuff, but I will in one slide rather than go through all this feedback. The best thing that I heard was I never thought that soil could be so interesting. How wonderful to hear that on your uh, anonymous course evaluations. Here's one which I, which I won't read in detail here. You can read it on your own, pause the video and check it out. Uh, but what basically what I'm driving at here is that the idea of having undergraduates and graduate students worked. You, it's maybe kind of counterintuitive, but um, that leads to a lot of interesting dialogue. And I have to say that the undergraduate students in this class just really shined. I'll come back to that in the concluding remarks. And uh, feedback that the presentations and this project-driven nature of it was, uh, was a nice piece of, of this class. So here we are at the conclusions. What can I say to, to wrap all of this up? Number one, I would say that we need to, as a profession, allow the childlike enthusiasm that people naturally have from a young age for the underground to flourish. It seems sometimes like we're doing our best to kill it, but we have to let it thrive and that can happen. Let it thrive the way that it thrives for the cosmos, the way that it th thrives for underwater, marine biology, that sort of stuff, we can do it. We have this natural um, playground and this natural way of getting students engaged that we need to think about. Undergraduates, I just mentioned this, but undergraduates and, and graduate students can mingle in a class and they should. These undergraduate students, I have to say, were just their enthusiasm, their interest was, was uh, a reminder to the graduate students that it can be so. Um, it's also a nice way of suggesting to the graduate students that they're part of this. If we don't, there's a pipeline here. If we don't get undergraduate students interested early in their engineering career in this kind of stuff, we're dead. Uh, so everybody is responsible for that. Not just me, but the graduate students and the people that will go out into practice and be professors uh, somewhere else. Uh, 
a success point that I didn't mention here is that all three of the undergraduates wind up uh, uh, undergraduates wound up coming to do research with me in the lab, which was very rewarding. And I think they would say the same. Terra mechanics is a wonderful way to get into um, soils, rocks. It's a way to do it without focusing specifically on geotechnical engineering, but it touches on it and, and many other areas. So this sort of fulfills focusing on this topic, which is inclusive, is a great way of, of capturing interest from many people, including people who would be classical geotechnical engineers, including people who would be more mechanics, uh, mechanicians, mechanics minded folks, geologists and robotics, you even saw is something um, something that we that we should think about. We have lots of mechanical engineering that goes into our prof profession. Finally, let's not shy away from advanced topics. Let's put them front and center. And really, this is to say that uh, maybe the first exposure for students to this world should be robots or geotechnical centrifuges or uh, doing field testing, seeing amazing field projects, uh, large projects. Maybe it shouldn't be uh, sitting in front of um, at a lab bench with a Casa Grande or Casa Grande device doing this sort of clackety clackety experiment, which might be driving people away. We should do the advanced stuff earlier in a way that's accessible and make our field as exciting as it really is. Okay, what's left here? Noam Chomsky. If you're teaching today what you were teaching five years ago, either the field dead or is dead or you are. I like that one. So let, the uh, last image I have here is of uh, Christopher, one of the students who I mentioned came and uh, he's a mechanical engineering student who came to work in the lab with me. And this photo was taken just as I was getting on the plane to go over to England to give this talk. And uh, Chris is here with me now down. He's doing wonderful things, getting the robot moving in all the ways that we're interested in making it move. And uh, he, I think it's too late to convert him to uh, civil engineering or geotechnical engineering. But at the very least, we're doing interesting things together that hopefully moves the profession forward. I'm having some trouble with my slides, but um, here we go with acknowledgments. In particular, Jaffe deserves a shout out for all of her fine work that appeared in this. Uh, I do want to thank the sponsors, including National Science Foundation, and thank you for watching my video. Take care.